Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the headlines first. The intra-Afghan negotiations between Kabul and the Taliban have begun in Qatar's capital city of Doha. Addressing the opening ceremony, Afghanistan's High Council for National Reconciliation head Abdullah Abdullah said Kabul seeks humanitarian ceasefire to be announced soon. Taliban leader Mullah Varadar Akhan said they acted accordingly to the Doha agreement signed with the United States. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Washington hopes both sides will enjoy cooperation with the neighbors. The Iranian army says it has intercepted three intruding U.S. spy aircraft during the ongoing naval and air exercises. In a statement, Iran's military said the drones left the air defense zone after the locally manufactured Karar drone was launched. Tehran is holding military exercises near the strategically vital Strait of Hormuz and the Sea of Oman. Palestine has recalled its ambassador to Bahrain shortly after Manama signed an agreement to restore ties with Israel. Palestinian National Authority's Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki summoned the envoy to discuss the aftermath of the deal. Earlier, Israel and Bahrain agreed to establish full diplomatic relations in a second breakthrough between Tel Aviv and its Arab neighbours. Fifty people have died when a gold mine collapsed in the Democratic Republic of Congo, southern Kivu province. A local mining NGO said the mine site near Kamituga caved in following heavy rains in the region. India has recorded the world's highest daily jump of over 97,000 coronavirus cases and more than 1,200 fatalities overnight. The country's infections have crossed 4.65 million mark, with the death toll reaching 77,472. Meanwhile, Pakistan's COVID-19 death rate continues to decline as three people died in the past 24 hours, taking the toll to 6,373. The coronavirus has claimed more than 915,000 lives and infected over 28.4 million people across the globe. News coming in detail after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. Now the intra-Afghan negotiations between Kabul and the Taliban have begun in Qatar's capital city of Doha. Addressing the opening ceremony, Afghanistan's High Council for National Reconciliation head, Abdullah Abdullah said, Kabul seeks humanitarian ceasefire to be announced soon. Abdullah said warring parties can agree to disagree and respect different viewpoints. Taliban leader Mullah Baradar Akhan said they acted accordingly to the Doha agreement signed with the United States. Akhun said the talk process may have some issues, but all sides must move forward with patience. United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Washington hopes both sides will enjoy cooperation with neighbors. He said the expansion of women participation in talks is an example of landmark achievement of the Doha deal. Pompeo urged Afghan parties must make decisions to move away from violence and towards prosperity. Now, Pakistan's Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa has discussed the regional security situation with U.S. CENTCOM Commander General Kenneth F. McKenzie. The military media wing said the two officials discussed the Afghan peace process and the ongoing situation in occupied Kashmir. Both Pakistan and the U.S. have welcomed the decision by Afghan warring parties for talks aimed at establishing peace in the region. Moving on, Palestine has recalled its ambassador to Bahrain shortly after Manama signed an agreement to restore ties with Israel. 
The Palestinian Liberation Organization has slammed the deal, saying it was another treacherous stab to the Palestinian cause. Palestinian National Authority's Foreign Minister Riyad al-Maliki has summoned the envoy to discuss the aftermath of the deal. Earlier, Israel and Bahrain agreed to establish full diplomatic relations in a second breakthrough between Tel Aviv and its Arab neighbors. In a joint statement, the United States, Bahrain and Israel said the agreement is historic to further peace in the Middle East. U.S. President Donald Trump said Bahrain will join the two countries for a signing ceremony at the White House on the 15th of September. Both the UAE and Egypt were quick to congratulate Bahrain and Israel on their decision, while Hamas has condemned and rejected the U.S. brokered agreement. In a statement, Hamas spokesman Azim Qasim said Bahrain has sided with the Israeli occupation against the Palestinian cause. He termed the deal as a political crime and a major failure to understand Israel's threats in the region. Meanwhile, the United Nations says Israel has razed 389 Palestinian-owned houses in the occupied West Bank from March to August, the highest average in the last four years. In a statement, the UN Humanitarian Office said the destruction left 442 Palestinians homeless. It said this huge displacement of people further exposed them to risks associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. UN official Jamie McGoldrick said the destruction of property in an occupied territory is prohibited under international law. The Israeli authorities routinely raise homes of the Palestinians on their own land in annexed East Jerusalem or the West Bank. Now, the Iranian army says it has intercepted three intruding U.S. spy aircraft during the ongoing naval and air exercises. In a statement, Iran's military said the drones left the air defense zone after the locally manufactured Karar was launched. It said the drones were given multiple warnings before they were chased away by Karar aircraft. Tehran is holding military exercises near the strategically vital Strait of Hormuz and the Sea of Oman. Iran says the three-day-long drills called Zulfakar 99 aimed to prepare the military to defend the country's territorial waters. Meanwhile, Turkey says three of its soldiers have been killed and another wounded during an operation in the country's east. In a statement, the Interior Ministry said a Gander Mary captain and two specialist sergeants were killed in Katak district of Van province. The ministry said the terror group PKK remains active in the region. Turkey holds PKK responsible for the death of some 40,000 people during a 30-year conflict. United Kingdom Prime Minister Boris Johnson has urged Conservative MPs to back his plan to override parts of the Brexit withdrawal agreement. The European Union has warned the UK it can face legal actions if it does not ditch controversial elements of the internal markets bill. In an online video call with around 250 Parliament members, Johnson said the Conservatives must not return to miserable squabbling over Europe. A Tory MP proposed an amendment to the bill which will affect trade between Britain and Northern Ireland. Meanwhile, the European Union's Parliament has threatened to drain any trade deal if the bill becomes the UK law. The next official round of talks, the 9th since March, will start in Brussels on September 28th. Now, 50 people have died when an artisanal gold mine collapsed in the Democratic Republic of Congo's southern Kivu province. A local mining NGO said the mine site near Kamituga caved in following the heavy rains in the region. The NGO said the young miners were in the tunnel as the mine caved in, trapping the victims inside. Mining accidents are common in the unregulated mines in Congo, where miners have to work without proper equipment. India has recorded the world's highest daily jump of over 97,000 coronavirus cases and more than 1,200 fatalities overnight. The country's infections have crossed 4.65 million mark, with the death toll reaching 77,472. The virus has claimed more than 915,000 lives and infected over 28.4 million people across the globe. More details in this report. 
The coronavirus pandemic has re-emerged in parts of the world, straining governments in their efforts to contain the disease. Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban says his government is drafting a war plan to counter the second wave of the pandemic. England's case count is doubling every seven to eight days as the government reminded public to play their role to keep the virus at bay. France has ruled out imposing a new lockdown to contain the resurgence, but said will implement a raft of less radical measures. In the face of this epidemic, our strategy is not changing. Fighting against the virus while avoiding to have to put on hold our social, cultural and economic lives, the education of our children and our capability to live normally. Canada has reported zero COVID-19 deaths in the past 24 hours for the first time since March 15th. In Latin America, the confirmed coronavirus death toll in Mexico has surpassed 70,000 after the government reported 534 new deaths overnight. Meanwhile, the Brazilian state of Bahia has signed an agreement to conduct phase 3 clinical trials of Russia Sputnik V vaccine. The government of Bahia signed a memorandum of understanding with the Russian government, with the Russian company responsible for the development of Sputnik V vaccine, and we signed a confidentiality agreement to have access to sensitive information about the development of this vaccine. COVID-19 deaths in Australia reached 803, but new daily infections in the country's largest hotspot of Victoria continued to fall. South Korea's new cases stayed below 200 for the 10th day in a row, but health authorities remain wary about no let-ups in sporadic cluster infections. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, three people have died from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, bringing the country's death toll to 6,307. The health ministry says 584 people tested positive for the virus overnight. It said the country has 6,046 active cases, while total reaches almost 301,000. The ministry said over 288,000 people have recovered so far. Sindh remains the most affected province with over 131,000 infections, while Punjab has reported more than 97,000 cases so far. As Balochistan has over 13,000 reported cases, while the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province has over 36,000 infections. Right now, we'll take you back to Doha, where Foreign Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Shah Mahmood Qureshi, is addressing the Afghanistan government and Taliban peace conference. Indeed, a long phase of devastation seems ending. A new dawn is upon us. This journey has not been easy. There have been obstacles and setbacks, moments of doubt and despair. Yet, progress has been made and deserved. Arriving at this infection point, has been an accomplishment, and this success belongs first and foremost to the Afghans. Pakistan has worked alongside you in every possible way by encouraging reduction in violence and by urging dialogue and negotiations. Pakistan has fully facilitated the process that culminated in the U.S. Taliban peace agreement in Doha on the 29th of February 2020. Commencement of intra-Afghan negotiations today is the fruit of our combined efforts. Excellencies, Pakistan and Prime Minister Imran Khan has long maintained that there is no military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. Political solution is the only way forward. We are gratified that our perspective is now widely shared across the international community. We are also gratified that we have fulfilled our part of the responsibility. It is now for the Afghan leaders who sees this historic opportunity work together constructively and secure an inclusive, broad-based and comprehensive political settlement. The forthcoming negotiations are for the Afghans to decide about their future. The Afghans alone.
must be the masters of their destiny without outside influence or interference. Spoilers from within and from without will pose formidable challenges. Constant vigilance will be required to guard against their machinations. We hope all sides will honor their respective commitments and remain unflinchingly committed to achieving a positive outcome. Excellencies, besides Afghanistan, Pakistan is the country that has suffered the most from the Afghan conflict. Over the past 40 years, we have endured terrorist attacks, loss of precious lives, mass population displacements, instability at the borders, and huge economic costs. Our citizens and law enforcement personnel have rendered invaluable sacrifices. Our leadership has decisively demonstrated that Pakistan will only be a partner for peace, excellences. At this historic juncture, it is imperative that the mistakes of the past are not repeated. The Afghan people must not be abandoned, as happened before. The progress achieved must not be flitted away. A peaceful and stable Afghanistan will bring new opportunities for the progress and prosperity of Afghan people. It will also open new vistas of cooperation and connectivity in the region and beyond. I suggest a four-pronged way forward. We call upon the international community and all concerned. One, to continue to support the Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace forces while respecting the consensus that emerges from intra-Afghan negotiations. Two, to ensure that Afghanistan neither witnesses the violent days of the past nor becomes a space for elements who would harm others beyond its borders. Three, to deepen and sustain economic engagement with Afghanistan for its reconstruction and economic development. To ensure a, and five, to ensure a well-resourced, time-bound return of Afghan refugees to their homeland with dignity and honor. Excellencies, at this moment of hope, I reassure our Afghan brethren that Pakistan will always be in full support and solidarity with them as they continue their momentous journey on the path of peace, security, and development. Pakistan will always support a peaceful, stable, united, democratic, prosperous, and sovereign Afghanistan at peace with itself and with its neighbors. I thank you. That was uh, Pakistan's Foreign Minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, addressing the Afghan peace talks conference via video linked. He said progress has been made and Pakistan has fully supported and uh, facilitated in the Afghan peace process. He also said Pakistan believes there is no military solution to the Afghan peace process. We'll keep you updated with the Afghan peace talks being held in Doha. Right now, we'll return back to the news stories. And as Pakistan's southwestern province of Balochistan, opulent in oil gas and minerals stipulates the country with an exclusive economic zone. Balochistan coast extends over 750 kilometers from Hub to Gwadar, giving the region an extensive strategic rank along with an international level of port activity. More in this special report by our correspondent Sumaira Khan from Gwadar. Sandy beaches and rocky shores along the Makran coast have stimulated attraction for tourists worldwide. The new highways, augmented telecommunication, an international port and improved security milieu boosted the urbanization in the region, particularly in Gwadar. 
in terms of the contact between the people of Gawadar and other parts of the world, in terms of exchange of knowledge, the knowledge and information that the people of this area have got and the knowledge of and information that the uh, other parts of the globe have. This is the time for exchange of that information in a highly secure environment. Ongoing development of Makran coastal area through fisheries, tourism, trade and social growth projects supervised by both government and army is proving to be a catalyst for entire Balochistan. This is the place from where the benefits of economy, the benefits of maritime connectivity, the benefits of regional connectivity uh, by exploiting its resources, by engaging its youth in different kinds of jobs and uh, industrial base is going to give a lot of boost to the region and uh, to the world. Makran Coastal Highway and M8 under China-Pakistan Economic Corridor have made a huge impact on the economy and socio-politics of southern Balochistan. They have boosted the local businesses of fisheries and tourism as well. While looking at the advanced levels being added to this ancient profession of boat making here at Gawada Boat Basin, it can be easily visualized that Pakistan is entering its present while having an eye on future but keeping its past intact. It's not only establishing an international level of port authority but it is also nurturing its ancient skills and its fishermen here. Reporting for Indus News, Sumaira Khan, Gawada City. Now, moving on, the U.S. and the European Union say they are determined to impose sanctions on Belarusian officials responsible for election fraud and a crackdown on protesters. Speaking to the media, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Stephen Bygun said Washington is coordinating curbs with the EU. He also urged Russia to push President Alexander Lukashenko to step down and give way to the will of his people. Meanwhile, in a statement, EU's Foreign Minister Joseph Borrell said the bloc is determined to impose curbs on Belarusians responsible for election fraud. The diplomat said the EU will take further restrictive measures if needed. He said Brussels deplores the increase in violence and forced exile of opposition members. Borrell said this shows Minsk's increasingly open disregard for the rule of law. Russia has condemned the extension of sanctions by the European Union, saying the bloc has missed an opportunity to normalize ties. In a press conference, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova said Brussels continues its accusatory rhetoric instead of trying to look for common ground. The spokesperson also slammed the new U.S. sanctions on three Russians over allegations of interfering in the elections campaign. Zakharova said such actions will not give the result Washington is looking for. Earlier, the EU officially extended its sanctions on the Russian finance, energy and defence sectors for another six months. The measures include travel restrictions and freezing of assets targeting 175 people and 44 entities. Now moving on to Mali, where experts appointed by the military leaders have proposed a two-year transitional government led by a president chosen by the army. In an eight-page charter, the constitutional experts wrote a 24-month transitional period was needed in light of the gravity of the crisis. They recommended the soldiers behind the coup choose the interim president and vice president and propose the prime minister. Under the proposal, the president will be a civil or military personality. This emerged on the second day of talks in Bamako, aimed at mapping a way forward in the wake of the August 18th coup. But the West African Regional Bloc has given the military until Tuesday to name a transitional president and prime minister. Now, in the United States, dozens of people are missing in Oregon wildfires that have displaced tens of thousands of people. The death toll from the western fires that began in August has reached to 25, with five losing their living in Oregon in a week. Wind-driven blazes have scorched the west coast states of Oregon, Washington and California. Oregon Governor Kate Brown says over half a million people are under one of the three evacuation alert levels. Brown said about 40,000 have already been ordered to leave. Oregon's Forestry Department Fire Protection says firefighters are still battling 16 large blazes. More than 68,000 people are under evacuation orders in California, with the largest fire in the state's history has burned over 3 million acres this year. 
Meanwhile, Greek authorities, with the help of aid agencies, have prepared to shelter migrants in hundreds of temporary tents. This comes after around 13,000 migrants were left homeless from a fire in their camp on the Lesbos Island earlier this week. The tents flown in by helicopters have been set up by the country's military. In a statement, refugee agency UNHCR said it has been highlighting the need to address the situation and conditions for refugees on the Asian island. The European Union and Greek officials said a new facility will be built on Moria with higher standards. The migrants, mostly from Africa, Syria or Afghanistan, have been living on the streets for three days without any shelter. Earlier, they also staged a protest over the poor living conditions. Now, in the Chinese city of Tianjin, a group of senior athletes have become local celebrities for their unique gymnastic skills. More about the acrobats in this report. Older but limber, a group of senior gymnastic enthusiasts are showing their skills in China's Tianjin, becoming celebrities among locals. They hold training sessions in a park and even have a fan club of their own. This is the life Tong Yugen always dreams of to become a gymnastics star. He finally realized his dream in his 70s and has even become the leader of a team of elderly athletes sharing the same ambition. We organized Lao Wen Tong gymnastics team 10 years ago. We felt very boring after retirement and did not know what to do. And so we started practicing gymnastics. The average age of the team is 60, with some senior members in their 80s. They outdo most young athletes by the stunning performances they put on. Combining gymnastics with Chinese acrobatics, they also created some unique performances, which takes both courage and years of practice. Don't be bothered by the old age. The elders should have their own ways to take pleasure. You should believe you are still young. That's what I do. The gymnastics team have a fan club of around 30 members, mostly ladies of their age, who often come to watch their skills. The gymnastics team now has over 300 members whose life after retirement seems to be anything but boring. Let's have a look at the weather updates across the globe. With the weather update, we've come to the end of this bulletin. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news. Take care.